Internal organs and organ systems are housed inside our body within closed spaces that we call cavities. A lot of these cavities are gonna be named according to the structures around them or the structures found within. We have two major body cavities. The posterior aspect is everything here in the orange. The ventral aspect it's all this multicolored stuff. So you can see, remember, posterior means toward the back and ventral means toward the gut. Now the posterior aspect is different from the ventral cavity because the posterior aspect contains cavities that are completely surrounded by bones and physically and developmentally different from the ventral cavity. So we use the term dorsal aspect rather than dorsal body cavity. Now I can tell you guys, I'm probably going to say dorsal cavity or posterior cavity a thousand times, but know the correct terminology now is posterior aspect. So the posterior aspect, remember, is completely surrounded by bone and it's divided into two separate areas. The cranial cavity, also called the endocranium, is formed by the bones of the skull and it houses and protects the brain. The vertebral cavity is formed by the bones of the vertebrae. Okay, so the vertebral column is made up of individual vertebrae. Now if you look at this image right here of a typical lumbar vertebrae, you see this little pokey piece that is at the bottom or the inferior part of this particular picture. That's what you feel when you rub down your back. So you're feeling that little projection. It's actually called the spinous process of the vertebrae. All of your vertebrae have that. Now, this hole right here surrounds the spinal cord. So all of your vertebrae, from your skull all the way down to your sacrum, have this hole in the middle. And of course, that allows for the spinal cord and some of the nerves to pass. The ventral cavity is much larger and subdivided into smaller cavities or spaces. The ventral cavities are not surrounded by bone like we saw with the posterior aspect. The ventral cavity is also separated into two smaller cavities called the thoracic cavity, which is the superior aspect, and the inferior abdominopelvic cavity. So right here between the lungs and the liver, we have a sheet-like muscle called the diaphragm. The diaphragm separates the entire ventral cavity into thoracic and abdominopelvic. Now those membranes that line the ventral cavity are called serous membranes. So that's a second difference not surrounded by bone, but surrounded by serous membranes that are double layer. So the serous membranes actually secrete a serous fluid that prevents friction between the organs in this cavity. So if you think about your ventral cavity, let's go back and look at that picture again. Look at all the stuff here in this ventral cavity and we are moving organisms. So without these serous membranes lining and secreting that fluid, as we're moving around, we would have a lot of friction between organs. Now, if you look at this upper picture, right up here in the upper right-hand corner, all of this green that you see outlining the space, that is an illustration of those serous membranes. So in order to understand this, let's use the analogy of a balloon and a hand to represent the serous membrane and an organ. Now, the serous membranes, as I mentioned, are double layered and they surround the space and the organs. So remember, the space is the cavity. So if we say that the hand is the organ, the balloon is the serous membrane, notice how the balloon has an outer part and then an inner part that's lying right on the surface of the hand, okay? So organs are referred to as viscera 
So the layer of the serous membrane that is lying on the organ is the visceral, oops, sorry about that, visceral serous membrane. Oh, come on. There we go. Now, the outer layer of that balloon is lining the space, so that would be like lining the abdominal cavity or the thoracic cavity. We call those membranes parietal membranes. So remember, viscera means organ, so that is the layer of the serous membrane that lays on the surface of the organ. The parietal membrane surrounds the cavity and the space between them, like here in the balloon where it would be filled with air, that is the cavity and it's filled with serous fluid. Now, that just takes you right back into what we just talked about, but gives you a different look of those. So remember, in the ventral cavity, we have the serous membranes secreting that lubricating serous fluid. Now, some of these cavities, and especially the smaller cavities, we give specific names within the larger cavity. So let's look at those layers of organization and all those cavities for a moment. Now remember, everything we're talking about here is ventral cavity, which is everything on the front, right? So you've got that subdivided into the thoracic cavity, which you see here in this image. Right there's your diaphragm. And below the diaphragm, we have the abdominopelvic cavity. Okay, so far so good? All right, let's go back up here to this thoracic cavity. We also subdivide the thoracic cavity into this area that's outlined with the dotted line right here. That is the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is a space within the thoracic cavity, and that's where the heart is located, along with a gland called the thymus, the esophagus that our food goes down, the trachea, which is our airway, and the major blood vessels that connect to the heart are all located within the mediastinum, which is in the thoracic cavity, which is in the big ventral cavity. You'll catch on, I promise. All right, we have a pericardial cavity. Peri means around, cardi refers to the heart. So the pericardial cavity houses the heart and it has two layers of the serous membrane. We call those serous membranes of the heart the pericardium. So the parietal pericardium surrounds the cavity the heart is in. The visceral pericardium lies on the surface of the heart. And then, of course, the pericardial cavity is the fluid-filled space between those two layers of the membrane. Still within the thoracic cavity, we have the pleural cavity. Pleura refers to the lungs. So pleura, the pleural membrane, is the two-layered membrane, just like we saw with the heart. We call it pleura. Pleural refers to lung. So the parietal pleura lines the cavity or the space the lungs are in. The visceral pleura lies on the surface of the lungs. The space is between the two layers of the serous membrane filled with serous fluid. You've probably heard of a condition called pleurisy. That's when you have an inflammatory response of the serous membranes associated with the lungs. There are several things that can cause that inflammatory response, a viral infection, pneumonia, but it can also occur with cancers or chest trauma, blood clot, lupus, so this leads to very painful breathing, uh, especially when you take a deep breath. Coughing and chest movement can make the pain worse, can cause fluid to collect inside the chest. And all of this, of course, leads to very painful breathing. So treatments for pleurisy depend on what the cause is. If it's a bacterial infection, you treat it with antibiotics. Sometimes, though, surgery or inserting a drain tube in the chest may be needed to get rid of all the infected fluid from around the lungs. And, of course, you can always take acetaminophen or ibuprofen to help with the pain and to sort of dampen down the inflammatory response.
And with this image, you just get uh, another view of those uh, serous membranes, the pericardium and the pleura. Okay, so we're still within the ventral cavity. Remember, everything we covered previously was up here in the superior thoracic cavity. Now let's drop down below the diaphragm and look at the abdominopelvic cavity. So the abdominal cavity, of course, is the superior most part of the abdominopelvic cavity, and it contains most of your digestive organs as well as your kidneys and most of the tubes called ureters that empty the kidneys and fill the urinary bladder. The pelvic area is between the hip bones. So you have the distal part of your colon, which is the large intestine, the inferior portion of the ureters, the urinary bladder, and any of your internal reproductive organs are going to be within the pelvic cavity as well. Now, just like we saw serous membranes lining the thoracic cavities and organs, we have serous membranes that line the abdominopelvic cavity and some of the organs as well. We call this serous membrane the peritoneum. It, just like we saw with thoracic, is a two-layered serous membrane that lines the abdominopelvic cavity, so we refer to that layer as the parietal peritoneum, and lying on most of the abdominopelvic organs, we have the visceral peritoneum, and of course the peritoneal cavity is the space between the two membranes filled with serous fluid and containing the organs. So if you've been paying attention, you've seen there's a whole lot of stuff in that abdominopelvic cavity, right? So it helps to be able to divide it into certain sections and refer to just that section and the organs found there. So we can divide the abdominopelvic cavity into nine regions, which are delineated by two transverse planes and two sagittal planes. Okay, remember transverse goes across, sagittal divides into a left and right. So obviously you get something that looks like a tic-tac-toe board, right? So those nine regions have very descriptive names for the most part. So let's begin in the center with the umbilical region. It's named for the umbilicus, which is your belly button or your navel. Your epigastric, epi means above, gaster means belly. So the epigastric region is above the umbilical. Hypo means below or under. So hypogastric lies below the umbilical region. To the left and the right of the umbilical region, you have the left and right lumbar regions. Lumbar refers to lower part of the back. You have the right and left iliac region. Iliac refers to a part of the hip. We'll learn that when we get to bones. And then the right and left superior most regions are called right and left hypochondriac. Now, don't think about your crazy aunt that's sick all the time. That's really not what that word means. Hypo means below. Chondri refers to cartilage. So if you notice this image of the ribs, all of this white stuff right here, not the more sort of yellowy looking or tan color out here, but this white stuff right here, this is cartilage. So right hypochondriac, left hypochondriac. Now, I want to call attention right here to something that students very often get confused about, and that's right and left. Now, when you're thinking right and left, well, obviously, if you're looking at this slide, this is on the right side of your body. This is on the left side of your body. But we don't think about ourselves when we're doing anatomy. It's always your patient, your model, your image, whatever you are looking at. Now remember, when you get confused about this, just put yourself in the same position. So if you're standing here looking at this slide, then again, your right is on this side, your left is on this side, but turn yourself the same way the picture is, and you will see that to refer to this correctly, this is right and this is left.
A second way to divide the abdominal pelvic cavity is into four quadrants, very simply named right and left, upper and lower. Now, if you can't figure this one out, we need to sit down and have a talk. But these are more commonly used clinically, or at least from what I personally have seen. But I want you to have sort of an idea on this particular one, the quadrants, not necessarily the nine regions, but have an idea of the organs that are located in each of these four quadrants. So let's begin up here with the right upper quadrant. You can see most of the liver, and right there is the gallbladder, which is inferior to the liver. Uh, you see part of the transverse colon and a little bit of the small intestine. In the right upper quadrant, you've got the spleen is going to be hanging out back here in the posterior aspect. Or, I'm sorry, not in the posterior aspect because we've already talked about that. But it's posterior to the stomach and a little bit lateral to the side. There is the stomach and you have a little bit of the liver. Again, more of the colon and small intestine. The right lower quadrant, you have the ascending colon, you have more of the intestine, you have the appendix, which uh, extends from the, the lower end or the inferior aspect here of the colon. Uh, you also have one half of the urinary bladder, as you do on the left lower quadrant as well. In the female, you would also have the uterus splitting between the two lower quadrants and an ovary on each side as well. Left lower quadrant, pretty much just the other half of the bladder, the other half of the uterus in the female, uh, the other ovary in the female, half of the prostate gland in the male, and more of the intestines. Now again, just use this unless otherwise specified because this is the more common way. And for my class, I want you to know the main organs within each of those cavities. So how do you think that would be helpful in the clinical setting? Well, if a patient comes in and they're like, oh, I have a stomach ache. Well, chances are they're not referring to the stomach because the stomach is this organ right up here. They're referring most of the time to something that's going on down here in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And a lot of times it is associated with intestinal issues. But what if a patient comes in suffering from pain in the right lower quadrant? Well, depending on exactly where it is, if it's really low, you're going to think appendix. If it's a little bit higher and it's a female, you may think right ovary. If they have pain in the right upper quadrant, probably going to ask them if they still have their gallbladder. So that's how this is useful. It helps to more accurately locate and describe the aches and pains and injuries and abnormalities that we may have.